back to another installment of Sales Pipeline Radio. So pull out your board, see if we can catch a few waves from the man who's riding them all, Matt Hines. Welcome, Matt. How are we doing, Paul? I'm doing good. Every week I try and come up with some obscure sport. Last week it was curling because I know you're a sports buff here. And I try to find, this is kind of a dead period for me. I know there's the hockey and uh, baseball started and everything, but it, I'm just looking for something to, uh, to you know, challenge you here. And I came across eSports. Are you a big eSports? Do you play games and com- watch competitive uh, eSports here? No, I'm old enough to wonder why eSports is a sport. <laughs> I've gotten to that point in my life where I'm accept- I accept X games. I accept some of the more, you know, like the snowboarding. Right. Uh, you know, now that they're Olympic sports, they're obviously legit. But uh, eSports is one of those, I like, you know, at some point, it's going to become an Olympic sport, and I'm just going to shake my head like oh, like an old person. <laughs> well, um, okay. Uh, there are limits to Matt Hines' uh, tolerance for sports or new, new sports here. There is. If you ask my wife, she'll think I'll watch pretty much anything. Like I got to tell but the joke in our house is I really don't – there aren't really very many shows, like TV shows that I watch except for sports. So, therefore, <laughs> it's on all the time. Um, no, this is a good time. We just we, we crowned a new Stanley Cup champion last night. Yeah. Uh, sometime before the end of the weekend, possibly tonight, we're going to have an NBA champion. Today is the first round of the U.S. Open Golf Tournament. Um, lots of lots of great um, rivalry uh, series going into baseball weekend. It's a great time to be a sports fan, there, Paul. And here I am searching for new sports, and it's right in front of me here. It's right in front of you. It's got ESPN.com. It's all right there. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, enough of that today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Very pleased to have you with us. If you're joining us live on the Funnel Media Radio Network, thanks for joining us in the middle of your workday. If you're joining us from the podcast, thanks so much for joining us. Our numbers continue to grow. It's exciting to be able to share with you uh, some of the best and brightest minds of, of B2B sales and marketing every week and every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio past, present, and future is available at salespipelineradio.com. As I mentioned, we feature every week some of the best and brightest minds in sales and marketing. Today is absolutely no different. We have the Vice President of Marketing from Level 10 Energy. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us today. Can we just keep talking about sports? Because that sounds like right up my alley. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Let's do it. So you pick a sport and I will ask you a question about it. Oh, I, I just had to close my laptop because I had the U.S. Open live stream going all morning, and I figured that would be Same. a from this call. <laughs> yeah, no, I um, well, I had a Skype, or no, I had a, um, I had a, uh, not a Skype call, I had a Zoom uh, call right before this, and I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear the person on the other line, and I assume it's because I'm in a hotel in Boston, and so I assumed it was because of my limited bandwidth, so I had to choose prospect call or U.S. Open and that was a tough call. I don't. I mean, I I had to think about: Do I want to hang up on the prospect, or should I just close down my video feed for a while? And um, so I'm a little behind. I don't know how things are going right now. And this is a live show, but most people are hearing a recording. So so it sounds like you were a golf fan. I am. Uh, I'm a, like you, I'm an I'm an avid sports fan. But yeah, golf hits home for me, and uh, I I love the fact that we get these live streams now. I mean, just the fact that I can sit at work and actually get stuff done. But I'm watching. They had two or three feeds going live. You could you could choose. I mean, it's kind of incredible. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I think about you know I don't, I, I don't know how old you are when I when I was growing up. You know, there was a the TV, and then this is where like you know this is my version of uh, running you know up the hill in the snow both ways going to school. I tell our kids all the time. You know, it used to be like you had to like there was a time you had to sit down and watch a television show. Like you had a specific time you had to watch it, and you had like choices of maybe three shows at a time. And if you wanted to watch the other show, you had to get up, go to the television, turn a knob, go to the other channel. My kids look at me like like I'm from Mars when I describe this foreign, ancient world to them. And then, and so you're right. Like now, like I mean, with the Masters and with the U.S. Open, you can watch a featured group. You can watch the practice tee. You can watch specific iconic holes. You can watch them all at once. Uh, you can watch them later tonight. It's just it's pretty amazing. It's amazing, and, and it sounds like we we might be similar ages here because I I can identify with everything you just described. <laughs> Well, um, yes, Paul. Paul wants to contribute. We're, we might not talk about sales at all today. We'll find out. But Paul, what do you got? I just want to let you know that I'm streaming the live uh, World Curling Championship right now here on the uh, watching, watching curling. I don't know if the it's a 
June, I would be surprised. Is there really live world curling? I thought you were going to give away a World Cup score there for a second. That's a whole other one, Paul. You're missing the Women's World Cup. Oh, I am. I'm, 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 I'll keep searching while you're talking here. I mean, the women's U.S. team apparently is scoring touchdowns, not goals, in their games. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, we live in a pretty amazing world. And uh, here's my attempt at a transition. You know, all that innovation we see and the complexity and the, the channels. I mean, we see that, obviously, in media. We see that in sports. And we see that in marketing now, too, Ryan. I mean, I think, you know, think about, you know, if, if you and I are similar ages, you know, I think it sounds like we both came up and, and came of age um, in a in a very different world for marketing and very different world for PR. I mean, I was at a when I came out of school, uh, University of Washington, in the late late nineties. Um, I was at a PR agency, and it was it was smiling and dialing with the reporters. It was press releases. It was media tours. Um, and I don't know how much of that still exists, but it, it feels like an ancient time. And you know, neither of us are that old, quite honestly. But so much just even in the last twenty years, it seems like it's changed quite a bit. Talk a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Like, what do you see? that have been some of the biggest changes in, in marketing in the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I like you, used to man the fax machine at, at, at the PR agency I worked at and <laughs> with Edelman and uh, yeah. used to do all that kind of fun stuff. And, you know, just listening to, I think it was one of the ad reads coming into the podcast from, from HubSpot, you know, think about the, one of the most innovative things they did at the top of the funnel was the website grader. Right, that everyone used was building their own websites for mom and pops, and they would give you this score, and it was you know instant demand gen, right? And it was one of the things that we used to talk about all the time about like how innovative was that? And of course, it's been eclipsed and copied a hundred times over. You know, I constantly think about you know the most all these innovations have been have been copied. I you know rarely do I see or do we see a true new channel emerge that no one has thought of that is just you know skyrocketing and, and someone's getting all the leads it it feels like we're at that saturation point it, it's one of the reasons why I, I re, i'm really invested in brand i think brand has kind of come back full circle where you, you can't ignore those channels you have to kind of participate in those things and and you and you better be really good at them because if you're average you're not going to get uh, any of the mind share but more than anything else, brand is kind of coming back to the top for me where, um, you know, my previous company before Level 10 was, was Blue Core, a startup out in, out in New York. And when I joined, there was probably 500 competitors in that space. There's probably 5,000 if you look at the Lumascape now. If your brand doesn't stand for something, that may be the differentiator. There's a lot of ways to do personalization these days. Someone's going to go with the one they know, the brand that they know, and that, that stands for something that they align with. So... Uh, yeah, there's just there's been a lot of change, that's for sure. So you think what's, what's, it sounds? I mean, what you were saying, and I completely agree with you. It sounds counterintuitive. Like we have way more channels, right? And so there's way more channels in in every channel. Like you think about just not TV is a channel, but TV has a million channels where it used to have like three or four. And online used to be thought of as a channel, but now online means a lot of different things. So there's a lot of different ways to get your message out there. And yet you're right. It seems like we are inundated with more messages than ever. It seems like our channels are noisier than ever. And so therefore, what, you know, what a lot of companies have thought of as, you know, their demand generation marketing efforts, you know, and from a, from a sales pipeline standpoint, we think about generating leads for the sales team. If we think we're just going to send an email Tuesday at 10 o'clock and think that that's going to do the, je- do the job, we're kidding ourselves. And so I, I think to your point, this is part of the reason I wanted to have you on the, on the show today is, is to talk about that balance between brand and demand, to talk about the intersection of brand and demand and how important I think brand has always been, quite frankly, to driving good demand, but how more and more marketers, more and more companies today are realizing that that needs to be a defined and a measured and a prominent part of their marketing mix. I'd be curious to list, I mean, you've been at you've been at Level 10 now for eh, almost two years. Like, how are you guys thinking about that balance that is that is investing in the brand, but also feeding a sales organization and driving some revenue responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the last piece you said kind of hits home. You know, when I was previous, you know, two jobs ago working at Microsoft, you know, doing a bunch of work for Xbox and, and Surface, you know, brand was a it was a healthy line item with a big healthy budget behind it, and that made a ton of ton of sense as we were trying to go after these consumers. Uh, you know, last, you know, current job and one before, these are venture back startups. So revenue goals for the year they kind of drive all decisions, and they really should. Um, Because if you aren't hitting those revenue goals, you may not have a future. So I tend to look at 
you know, brand is going to be an output of demand generation uh, for, for any early stage startup. Um, there, there isn't, at least I haven't seen a lot of appetite or, or interest in, you know, taking a healthy chunk of my, my annual budget and going to buy billboards up and down 280 or 101. That's not going to move the needle for us in terms of, you know, how am I going to get leads in front of my, my account execs and give them great opportunities. So for us, it's saying, okay, let's really focus on the demand generation, but the brand, and I'm using air quotes and realizing nobody can see it, the brand has to be a byproduct of that. So it's, you know, what does it look like? What are the messages you're actually saying and, and how are you saying them? Um, really has to be pushed through those demand genera- generation efforts, whether that's an email campaign or, or a piece of content. Those, those channel efforts have to reflect what it is you're saying that, that your company is going to stand for, right? You know, Level 10 Energy is, is entering the energy space, which is pretty old school, right? This has been dominated by, you know, 100-year-old companies as they try to make, you know, lots of transitions from fossil fuels and into clean tech. And we have a real opportunity to say, hey, we think this place needs a lot of data and a lot of technology to help it scale. Uh, so we're seen as kind of a, a disruptive young company. Well, that should be reflective in, in the things we do. We shouldn't talk and act like a 100-year-old company. We shouldn't talk and act like a company that's three years old and growing year over year, you know, super fast. That, that's where I kind of see that the brand has to align with demand chain in that way. So is, I think there's there's the there's a tension between sometimes brand and demand. There's also sometimes in companies the tension between what's needed long term to build a brand and to ultimately support pipeline growth and inbound interest from your target accounts, but also what someone last week described to me as the crack of transition of transactional marketing which is the, you know, hey, we need leads now. Hey, how can we invest in something that isn't going to generate, you know, re- impact right away if we need to generate logos right now to get to the next round of funding? Um, and look, I mean, it's one thing to talk strategically about this balance between brand and demand, but when the rubber meets the road, when the sales team's behind on their number for the quarter, I mean, you know, I've been in, I've been in inside company where we do this a lot as, a, as consultants, but I've been inside companies running marketing where, you know, that is the very real challenge. And it's, it's the hard thing about hard things, as Ben Horowitz says, but, you know, talk a little bit about sort of how culturally and then operationally, ins- operationally inside a company, inside a venture back company, how are you balancing that long-term vision with still feeding the beast on a, on a short-term basis? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, obviously, in any marketing efforts or, or outbound, you know, sales efforts in, in a company this size, you know, we're, we're, we're 21 people, um, it's, it's likely all hands on, deck, uh, hands on deck. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of eyes on this. You're not getting lost in the shuffle. You know, if we run a, a, a webinar, everybody's involved. And so... The success of that is kind of very apparent. People want to know, hey, is, is, is this successful? So there's almost not an opportunity to get lost thinking too long term about big, broad campaigns um, that, that aren't going to have true ROI driving those near term results because everybody is chomping at the bit. You know, we, we are in a planning cycle. You know, we might have 12 month plans, but really we're in a quarterly planning cycle. And, and we need to have the ability, because we're small, to turn on a dime and, and do something different, or if an opportunity presents itself, we can go after it. And that's why we want to keep these tight planning cycles. I, I don't want to be married to a long-term marketing objective that's you know a year out or, or three years out, just because we wrote it down on paper and said, that's what we're going to go hit. We, we have the, the flexibility to, to be nimble. We really need to kind of adhere to that and, and find things that, that are going to work. And I think that that goes along with we can experiment on a, on a bunch of stuff, and, and we should um, because we're we're a nimble company. We should also figure out if something's not working and ditch it really fast. Uh, there's just absolutely no reason to keep banging our heads against the wall if, if we had a good idea and, and it's not producing leads or, or or new new opportunities for for AEs or what what have you, whatever the metric is. If it's not working, just trash it and find something new. And um, that's that's another advantage that we have in terms of size. Well, I think, you know, you bring up a lot of good points here just in terms of, you know, the investment in brand early on. It doesn't, I mean, look, this doesn't have to be, let's buy a bunch of, you know, billboards on the side of a highway, but sometimes brand is just having having a, a good message and a consistent message, having a message that is appropriate for the market, um, having a message that is consistent across your channels. 
Um, that's something that I think, you know, not a lot of early stage companies really prioritize. They want to be agile. They want to be scrappy. They want to move quickly. But then you end up with a bunch of disjointed campaigns that don't look the same, that have different messages. Sales is saying one thing, marketing is saying the other. And you can grow that way, but it creates so much friction in the process that it just becomes expensive growth without building any real brand equity. So I, what I hear you saying is that, you know, building a brand isn't about spending money. It's about having a good position and being consistent applying that to the market through, the, through whatever channels you are using. Did I get that right? Oh, I mean, I, I, I think you nailed that. We, I oftentimes try to think about how, how do I know if the brand, if, if what we're saying is, is resonating and working. And it's, it's not a quantitative thing. I can't pull up the CRM and look at a report and say this is working. It's the comment that comes back from a conference where, you know, my CEO says, you know, so-and-so walked up to me and said X. Or it's a feedback from a customer who came in and said, hey, I've been watching you guys for a year. I kind of knew a year ago we wanted to work with you because you were doing these types of things in the market. Those are the things you kind of grab onto and you say, aha, you know, we're, we're kind of working here. But it also, I, I think, you know, I've experienced this, as, as we grow as a company, uh, we build more products, we build more features, we go into different markets, we expand, and as, you know, we, we, we add headcount, you know, we, we go from 20 people to 40 people, and pretty quick, you have to be cognizant to go back and do that check Right is is what we stand for still kind of uniform through the company, or can, have we lost our way? I mean, we did this at Bluecore, where I would literally go talk to people and say, "Hey, tell me what Bluecore does." And if you're asking ten people and you get ten different answers, you've lost. You've kind of grown out of that, and you have to actually run a program with your with your exec leadership team and kind of roll it out to the rest of the company to say, "Hey." we've gotten really far away from what our vision is or our vision has changed. We need to recalibrate and get everybody else on the same page. Cause as you said, if we're all saying different things, then the brand becomes somewhat, you know, murky and you don't really know what you're about. Yeah, I want to ask you a question about working in an old school industry. Uh, I worked at a startup years ago. We were in the residential real estate space and you know, the idea of sort of digital transformation to realtors at the time, especially at the very beginning of that work when, you know, the M I mean, people don't remember this, like the MLS was not public. You could not see listings online. Realtors had access to a private system where all the listings existed. So merely opening that Pandora's box was an enormous amount of change for the real estate industry. And I think there's still quite a bit in real estate that hasn't changed in the last, you know, 15 years or so. Talk about what it's like working within a company that is disrupting an old industry and sort of, you know, on one hand, you are sort of pushing the envelope into new into new areas. But on the other hand, in many cases, you still have to partner and you still rely on relationships and partnerships and alliances with the old guard. How do you balance that? And how does that how does that work in so far for level 10? Yeah, no, good point on the front. I mean, I think that's what was most interesting about this opportunity when I looked at it. I, I remember sitting down with Bryce, our CEO, and I, I just thought, gosh, this feels like Zenefits when they went into the insurance space and just said, you know, how this place is still doing so much work in Excel offline, you know, spreadsheet work that it felt like a great opportunity. And that's that's kind of what level 10 uh, look like to me, and I think from a marketer standpoint, you go, gosh, we can do so much here that is just going to be, you know, a breath of fresh air for folks who have to work in this space. Um, but I, but I think on the on the on the back end, what you end up realizing is, especially with with energy and kind of the rise of, of sustainability. You know, five years ago, there weren't sustainability teams. Most Fortune 1000 companies didn't have these initiatives. So the folks we're, we're talking to are new in their roles, tackling really difficult from our perspective contracts and, and purchases these are huge purchases and huge commitments for these for these organizations so they need a lot of support so when i think about our content program our content program isn't isn't really oriented towards you know 100 percent demand gen it's really oriented towards there's a lot of education that has to go on um, they need a ton of support it means we have some pretty long sales cycles but they need the help and they actually want the help I just keep thinking, you know, we have an, an SDR team here. Folks answer the phone and, and actually re reply to emails because they they really want some support, which is totally a brush of fr uh, <laughs> so some fresh air considering you know where I came from before, where where there's five thousand companies calling into the same marketing manager, you know. 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, and then I'm curious also like inside the organization, you know, we were talking earlier about sort of old school versus new school, both in terms of an industry, in terms of sort of ways of doing sales and marketing and PR, you know, when you're venture back, that, that means you've taken someone's money and that means you have to listen to them as well. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people sometimes that don't have sales and marketing experience may have some advice of what you should be doing. Some of that advice may be good. And some of that may not be good. Um, and I remember, you know, distinctly sort of working in that environment in a couple of different places, but I'm curious, you know, both your, you know, your experience at Blue Corps, you were the first marketer there, um, you know, coming at Microsoft, your experience at level 10, you know, it, uh, I think there, there are as many people in the organization that feel like they know the tech and the IT side is that as number of people that think they know marketing, how do you accept, especially in an, in an, in a business that you where by definition, you don't have the answer. I mean, every startup by definition is still figuring out how they're going to market. And so there isn't a complete playbook of how to do it yet. How do you balance the advice that you get from so many different people across the organization? You know, you know, in some cases, picking and choosing the good stuff, but also keeping yourself and your team focused. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think the, the saying goes, everybody's a marketer. Uh, I, I certainly can't walk over to my CTO and, and give him feedback on his code. Uh, nor, nor should I, because I'd be way, way, way out of bounds there. I think you're right. I, th I think that's the reason why you have plans, or the reason why you kind of map what any team is going to do towards some of the uh, higher level, you know, company objectives. I'm actually okay with people coming up with, hey, let's try these things, um, so long as it's, you know, reasonable within budget and you know something we can go try. I, I, I don't want to get stuck in the place where. I'm so dogmatic about the playbook I ran at Blue Core, the playbook I ran last year, that I'm not open to to some other idea. Especially in, in, in energy, I didn't come from the energy space, so I don't have the background. We've got a great team here, and most of the folks on our team, you know, 20 plus people, all came from energy. I look at it as they probably have insights more than I do in terms of who our customer is and, and how they like to operate and where they want to be reached. So. I actually want those ideas. I, I think it's great when folks come to me and say, hey, have we tried this? Obviously, some of them work and some of them don't, but that experimentation is kind of part of the process. Awesome. Well, just a couple more minutes here with uh, our, our guest today, the VP of Marketing for Level 10 Energy. And Brian, before we let you go and let you get back to the US Open, which I'm about to do as well, uh, you know, we like to ask a lot of our guests just to, to help finish up with, you know, just sharing a few people uh, recommendations for others of people in your career that have been influential for you. They can be authors, speakers, writers. Um, they could be past managers, mentors. Um, just, you know, if you can name maybe one or two people that have been particularly influential for you that you might recommend other people seek out or check out as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow from your, from your guest from last week, which was Sendoso. You know, I do the same thing where there's some really good content on, on LinkedIn, um, and, and those folks are, are kind of great to kind of follow those conversations and, and dig in with that. Um, I think there's, there's also those folks that are kind of in your own personal community. I've, I've had a 20-year you know, relationship with, with someone named Gavin Hewitt, who's a, a VP of sales at a bunch of different companies. We work together at, at, at Blue Core, and he's, he's a great sounding board. He's, he's probably more of an entrepreneur at, at, at heart that's, that's doing you know, VP, VP of sales work. But he just has really broad insights and thoughts about how things could go and kind of balances my realism to, to a certain extent. So I think those types of folks that kind of provide the insights that, that you don't have in, in, in your you know, nature are, are, are the ones I really look to kind of give me that feedback and that inspiration on, on certain topics. So, um, you know, LinkedIn and kind of good, good mentors and people in, in your network are, are definitely vital. All right, awesome. Well, last, last question at the risk of pushing the timeline here with Paul, so I want to see him sweat just a little bit. Um, you're a sports fan. Uh, what If you could pick one sporting event in a 12-month period to go to, which sporting event are you going to go to and why? Uh, the Masters, without a doubt. Uh, been to it once, had the, had the lucky opportunity to go. And it's the one event, I think, that if you watch something on, on TV and you think, oh, gosh, it'd be so cool to go that. And I'd have had the – the lucky opportunity to, I've been to a Super Bowl and, and been to a bunch of really cool stuff. The Masters is the one event that delivers far and beyond what you see on TV. You're, you're just looking at this amazing, amazing playground for golf and you're going, that would be really cool. And then you get there like, this is so much better than it looks like on TV. So definitely looking forward to the Masters. Do you have tickets for me? 
Uh, I do not have tickets for you. I feel the same way about it. I have not been, um, but I got a buddy and I that we have made the commitment that uh, 2020, this is going to be our year to finally get out there. And uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because that's, I feel like I could, if they would broadcast the Masters and uh, you don't even do it on a, in a week when they're not playing, just show me pictures of, just keep, get the camera going of the course. It is just the most, one of the most beautiful things. Uh, to see on TV, so I'm, I'm excited to get out there. Well, we got to go. Paul is definitely sweating now, but I want to thank our guest again. We got a VP of marketing for Level Ten. If you've enjoyed this uh, this episode of the Sales Pipeline Mar- Pipeline Radio, you want to hear it one more time, you can check it out in a couple of days up at SalesPipelineRadio.com. We'll have a summary of this conversation up on our blog at HeinzMarketing.com in a couple of days as well. We out of time. Thanks again to our guests and for my great producer Paul. This is Matt Heinz. You've joined us for another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. been listening to another episode of Sales Pipeline brought to you by the good folks at Heinz Marketing.